Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Judy Maggio. Welcome to Decibel Dialogue. And our guest today is Austin City Council Member Greg Kassar, District 4, North yeah. Austin, in your second term. That's right. Started out as like the youngest member of the City Council ever, and now you're like a grizzled That's veteran. right. I crossed 30 uh, last month. So I feel very grizzled. Do you age faster when you're yeah, in public office? I got my first gray hair in this job. <laughs> Welcome to middle age. Yeah, you're, not, you're not even close. Well, lots of things to discuss today. And, and it's a, usually a council day, but you guys are off we're today. Off this, oh, we're off this week uh, mm -hmm. because we have two council meetings next week. Uh, so we've got a lot to cover. And how many items do you think you're going to be covering I think next week? Almost 200. I think it's crossing, like getting close to a record. I don't think they've had an agenda this long under the 10 1 form of government. I think the last time was the last council meeting before, before the government change. Yeah. Okay, so does that mean you guys are on break after that? That means we'll be on break for a month. Unlike the legislature, we don't have like a year and a half break. We'll be for right back yeah. in August to start working on the budget. And um, I'm sure you'll be ready to disconnect for a little while. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, one of the things I want to talk to you about is homelessness because we had the opportunity today to take a tour of the arch. Yeah. And I know that this has become number one priority for the That's city. Right. So I want to talk first of all about the ordinances, which I think will be up for a vote on all of Next those. Yep. Yeah, all of those items. Among those items will be the homelessness ordinances. Talk about that and where you see that discussion going and what you would like to see from your perspective. Right. And so uh, I think it's really important uh, that you were at the Arch because we know that the solution to homelessness is to address the economic and human issues at the core of this, right? People need shelter, people need housing, people need services, and for too long the Arch wasn't providing the level of services necessary for us. We weren't supporting the Arch in the way that we needed to to get people out and to get people housed mm -hmm. so that people aren't going to the Arch but rather are going through the Arch mm -hmm. to their next place. And so we really know that services and housing are, are key and, and core ways of addressing the issue. However, we had an audit uh, back in 2017, a series of three audits on how we were handling homelessness. And that's what we found. We needed more housing, more low cost housing, more services, and that some of our criminal justice enforcement was actually, instead of getting people out of homelessness, was getting people stuck mm -hmm. further into homelessness. And so next week, we have on the agenda to actually potentially purchase another shelter uh, to, and we actually recently opened a shelter in East Austin with the help of the Salvation right. Army. To hopefully is this go the women and children shelter? No, that is the Rath Gaber That's shelter, Rath which is shelter. a family this shelter. This is a different one. Yeah, um, one. and to potentially get another one so that we could potentially go from zero working shelters uh, to going to three and three well working shelters alongside our housing bond so that people have a place to go to. So on our agenda is to get to a place where we have three shelters, more services, getting people into housing, and to change our ordinances so that if somebody is actually doing something that we could identify as wrong, that we could still intervene. But if somebody is just homeless, if somebody is just sleeping in their car, or if somebody is just uh, sitting on a corner asking for money, that we couldn't call that a criminal violation any longer. Right now, people are surprised to find out that if a person is sleeping in their car, which we know that there are dozens of AISD families every night that yes, sleep in their car, right. that that is currently a breaking criminal law inside of the city of Austin. And that means people could get tickets in the vast, vast majority of the cases. If you're homeless and you get a ticket, you can't pay it. You wind up with a warrant. And if we're trying to get you housing and you have an active warrant, you almost never get housed. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to change our ordinances so we stop punishing people just for being poor and instead make sure that our ordinances actually cover behavior rather than just the status of being homeless. So you're talking about the ordinance that deal with like panhandling and camping and those types of That's issues. That's right. right. So um, it would still be against the law to be aggressive, whether you're asking for money or just asking whether you're homeless or not, whether right. you're asking somebody for money or asking another So the question. public safety, because I, I have heard people right. raise public safety concerns that if these um, ordinances are watered down a bit and this, the penalties aren't as steep, they're worried about the public safety of folks. Exactly. And the issue is we're not changing anything as it relates to public safety parts of the ordinance. It's just that currently in the law, it says it's illegal to ask for money if it's 730 at night, period. Mm -hmm. And if a person doesn't have enough money to eat and somebody has to ask for money and they ask for money in a way that isn't breaking any laws, mm -hmm. then how could we say that that's a criminal violation of the law and then potentially re-put that person into having more, more tickets and more warrants and can't get them housed, it doesn't help. Mm -hmm. We know that we can do other things to help, which is why on that same agenda, 
we are voting to build shelter, to provide services, and to Wrap tax. Around services. Yeah, and actually to bring people back onto the tax rolls uh, that live on the lake that have not been paying taxes yeah, for a long so time, which also would bring in money to address those very issues. Let, let's talk about that issue. And, um, I, and there's one other thing I want to talk about homelessness, but since you brought up the what is now being called the mistake on the lake, I've lived here since 1978. I had no idea this right. was an issue. None of us knew. And, um, and for those of us, for those of you watching who aren't familiar with this, this is an issue where there were, I don't know how many- 400 properties. 400 properties on Lake Austin, mm -hmm some of multi-million dollar homes that had not been paying city property taxes. That's right. And it was because of an old 1986 ordinance. That's right. So back in the 1890s, uh, these properties were added to the city Believe of Austin. Believe it or not, I was not covering news no. in 1890. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted you to know that. Thank you. Duly noted. So in the 1890s, they were brought into the city of Austin, but weren't taxed for whatever reason. And, um, and then coming up into the 1980s, uh, the city of Austin started saying, well, these people are part of the city. Everybody else is paying property taxes, but they aren't. So maybe we should. But there was a lot of uproar, pushback uh, from a variety of people living there and other leaders. So in 1986, the city council actually wrote into law saying these 400 properties wouldn't have to pay city taxes. Um, and in fact, nobody, and then it really wasn't talked about very much. Um, nobody that I know of on the city council knew about this until a nearby property owner who was paying city taxes right, said, hey, what's sued, the deal? <laughs> sued the city and yeah. said, I want the same deal because yeah. this is unfair. And we said, well, we don't want to give you the Valid same deal, point. <laughs> but it is unfair and the way yeah. we'll fix it is by applying the same rules to them that apply to everybody else, which is everybody that is within the full purpose jurisdiction of the city and votes in bond elections and votes for council and members. And get city services. And, and they get city services, mm -hmm. should, should pay the property tax just like everyone else. Um, and so we are, we'll be voting to undo that 1986 ordinance also next Thursday. And we're asking the city manager that once those funds come in to one, that will help us stop having everybody else subsidize services to this area. And then two, that will hopefully free up dollars that used to go to subsidizing services in this area to provide key services like services to get people off the streets right. and early childhood services. Cause that has been also, homeless services is a huge priority in this council, but also we know that early childhood mm -hmm. and high quality childcare is increasingly becoming an issue in the mm -hmm. city. And the so we want to dedicate, dedicate that to, to Okay, yeah. great. Um, we were watching the legislature with uh, a lot of attention because you know usually there's a lot of, as we've come to know, Austin, Austin bashing. bashing. Yeah, but this time around, it was kind of a double-edged sword. I know that most members of the council and mayor were against what was signed into law yesterday. And that was SB2, which would cap the amount you can raise taxes without a vote of the taxpayers. Uh, so let's tackle that first. How could that impact Austin City Hall? Yeah, that is, it is a, a forced austerity bill. Uh, the fact of the matter is our property taxes fund primarily police, fire, EMS, our libraries and our parks. And just to keep those going, because of the increasing cost of healthcare, because of the increasing cost of providing services to a growing city, um, we won't be able to keep on providing those levels of services at a 3.5 cap. Um, it's going to save, that 3.5 cap is gonna save people a so, hundred bucks. so, yeah. so little money. Um, uh, previous estimates were actually significantly lower mm -hmm. than what even you just said, just a, a few dollars a month. We're still, we're still gonna get the final numbers back actually at this June 20th council meeting. But over the course of five years, without adding any new city programs, right? That's not adding, opening a new shelter, that's not coming up with new ideas, dealing with anything that may come up over the course of the next five years, just continuing to provide the services that we plan to provide. Over five years, we'd be at a $60 million budget deficit. That would mean cutting huge chunks of either parks, libraries, police, fire, or EMS. It's not because we're picking on those, that's what property taxes pay for. Right. And so um, we will most likely, I imagine at some point, either um, have to go to an election and go to the voters uh, to try to keep our city going because we're not going to make, I don't wanna be a, on a council making draconian cuts to basic fire service or to basic EMS right. service or shutting down libraries. And so my hope is that we will be able to show voters what Greg Abbott wants our budget to look like and what Austin's budget should look like. And, and, and we'll have to sort of have that conversation. So before we talk about some of the other issues before the state legislature that, that didn't get axed as someone might have predicted, 
What do you say to people who are having to move out of the city because they can't pay their property taxes? Right. They're probably saying, hey, 100 bucks a year or however much it's gonna save, that'll help a little bit. Yeah, well, the fact of the matter is the vast, vast majority of the property tax increase that people see and feel is their school district taxes. And the legislature also signed into law putting more money into the school system, which will reduce some of the property tax yeah. burden. I don't think they went nearly far enough, but the property tax decrease that they will see will be almost entirely because of funding the schools right. a little bit yeah. more. Anything that they see yeah. um, is largely not gonna be based on the revenue cap. And the affordability challenge that's created is we have some people whose insurance premiums are going up because they're not close enough to a fire station. If we can't add fire service, the people's loss of insurance premium is going to, people's increased in insurance, right. it will, could very well eat up any potential mm -hmm. savings, not to speak of all the public safety challenges that that comes with. Or, you know, we go to library and we can go to the library for free. Not being able to go to a library, having libraries shut down for maybe a couple bucks saved a month, that, that isn't worth it, I don't think. Um, the real burden that people feel um, is the increasingly rapid uh, increased valuations of people's homes, which we need to address by adding more housing in the city um, and in different kinds of housing types. And then two, they're not adequately funding the school system. And so the, the school tax has to go up. Well, yeah, and the school tax is the biggest part of your ta property tax bill. So that makes sense that, that the yeah. impact comes from there. And the, increase is, and the increase in taxes isn't just proportionate to how big the school tax is, right. the actual school uh, because they continue to not fund public schools, then they just make it up on the backs of Austin taxpayers. Um, I do want to talk about the issues that people were worried about, and these were two issues you were very involved in, and that's fair chance hiring and uh, paid sick. So um, what efforts were made on the part of City Hall, and were you surprised that, that the legislature didn't go? Yeah, Austin bashed back. You know, we, <laughs> we did everything that we could. People showed up and filled the hearings. People testified in the Senate and at the House for hours that we had way more supporters of sick days and fair chance hiring than there were opponents. Um, and also, we had a lot of solidarity. I mean, these uh, laws that the legislature was promoting would have taken away people's right to sick days, would have taken away people's right to fair chance. They also would have nullified our non-discrimination ordinances. So they were attack on the LGBT community right. as well. And so we had people, they, had, they banned uh, scheduling laws, basically taking away people's right to a water break working in the Texas sun. So I think in many ways they tried to take away so many basic workers' rights protections, LGBTQ workers' rights protections, water break protections, sick days, that it, it caused a lot of an uproar. And we had a lot of legislators on both sides of the aisle, uh, but Democratic leadership in particular, that said, this just isn't right, and, and they fought back hard, and, and, and community members from all of the state were fought back hard. Polling also came out uh, from the University of Texas, as well as at the Texas Tribune, that showed that amongst Democrats and Republicans alike, having laws that guarantee people sick days were overwhelmingly popular. And so I think lots of folks uh, at the legislature said, you know what, maybe bending this hard for the special interest to take away people's mm -hmm. sick days may not go well with my constituents, even if they're from a Republican district. But you know, the, there was an outcry over SB4 too, and that still passed. That's Do right. Do you think the makeup of the legislature this time around uh, swayed it in your favor? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the legislature flipped increasingly towards the opposition. You know, a lot of Republicans who thought they were in safe seats lost their seats. Mm -hmm. So I think there was um, some idea that they, that they couldn't go so hard right on mm -hmm. some of these issues. The revenue cap, in my view, is still, you know, directly attacks vulnerable people, it forces austerity. I mean, we have to start creating budgets like we're in a recession when we're in the middle of a boom. And that, and that is horrible for everyday people. So I don't want to play down how bad that was, but I do think that there was a glimmer of hope that people showing up from all over the state demanding basic rights on the job won the day when a lot of people thought that it wouldn't win the day. So another thing on the agenda, uh, I believe, coming up is the uh, issue, oh, 4700 Riverside. Yeah. So where do we stand on that? This is this is development on East yeah. Riverside, and um, it's been, you know, it, people say it's another example of gentrification, yeah. it's gonna push people out. So will that be on the agenda, or is that not till August? That won't be on the agenda until August at the earliest. Um, and that is a really serious issue. You know, we have, escalating housing prices 
all over the city and we need more low income housing, subsidized housing, and just housing generally so that we don't push people out. At the same time, adding housing in a way that could potentially displace lots of people with it. If adding the new housing is contingent on lots of low-income people potentially being pushed out, that's a real concern mm -hmm. and a real problem. And I think when we've been talking about Code Next and now the new rebooted effort of just rewriting the Land Development Code, we recognize that we can actually add hundreds of thousands of homes inside the city um, without having to demolish low-income people's housing in the process. Um, and the reason we need to add those hundreds of thousands of homes is as people are born and as people move here, if we don't all fit, it's like a, a pitcher of water that's three quarters full. If you pour water on top of that, some, somebody's gonna get displaced. So we have to create room, but we don't have to do that on the backs of low-income folks. And so- The pitcher's kind of overflowing already. It's overflowing <laughs> and we need to add, you know, add pitchers or add size to the pitcher. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, we are gonna continue yeah. seeing the displacement that we see. And the transportation, oh, go ahead. Yeah, but I think the concern there is for me, you know, I had and fought against real concerns about Oracle on East Riverside. Mm -hmm. Um, where they displaced a low-income housing complex. And I don't think that was good. That was bad for them to do that. And I have really similar concerns uh, on East Riverside on this proposed project. And I think people are raising real, real concerns about that. And because it's so big and because there's so many low-income people that live nearby, I think in many ways it could spur further gentrification. So I think people should be looking at that really carefully uh, and raising concerns about it because I, I don't feel good about it right now. Okay. Yeah. Um, transportation is something we focused on for the last couple months at Decibel, and, and I have a feeling that in 2020 we're going to see a, a big transportation yeah. bond. Uh, where are we with transportation? Because for you know for a city that is so on the cutting edge in a lot of different ways, we're not so much on public with, transit. <laughs> we are. Yeah, way we're behind. kind of way behind. Yeah. So, what what's being discussed? Yeah. Right now, what we are talking about is how do we get more people in and around the city outside of traffic, right? Because there's just no way, I mean, if you could turn these cameras around, right, we could see all of the cars stuck in front of us when we have so many people that are just sitting in a car by themselves and that's your only option, then nobody wins. Yeah. And, uh, and more and more people trying to fit into downtown when we can't, it's not like we can widen the streets. I mean, there are, there's buildings, right? There's people, so what do you do? The, the only solution that has existed for you know, decades and decades, but we haven't really picked up as much here in Austin is to get people into mass transit, which moves way more people, way more efficiently, and we can do it outside of traffic. Yeah. And so the hope and the idea is to work with the community to come up with how in its own pathway we can get either rapid buses or trains or a combination of the two where you can get lots of people back and forth from home into their job or to pick up their kids or to see f friends and family in a way that you're not sitting in traffic, which might mean we need to build sidewalks so that people can more easily walk to the mass transit. Mm -hmm. We know it, we need it to be reliable. We know we want people to be able to show up and know that within the next 10 minutes, it's gonna come and that it's not gonna get stuck in traffic with everything else, so it's gonna get there fast enough. So that means dedicating lanes um, or dedicating pathways and the discussion is whether that should be buses, whether that should be trains, whether it should be a combination of the two and where that mass transit should go. And don't forget about scooters. And don't forget about the fact that some people may scoot one way or the other. I'm more but about- But now there are rules in place. And now right? there's rules in place. I actually like the e-bikes yeah. better. I feel like those are more well, reliable and yeah. stable. Yeah. Some people choose the scooters, but I, I'm, I'm more of a bike person. Anything else we haven't covered that you, you would like people in Austin to know that is on the agenda before you guys break and to, to watch out and, and come, possibly come speak out on yeah. something they care about? S some, something else, uh, a couple of other things that I've put on the agenda for the last council meeting is one, uh, preserving and protecting mobile home parks in the city. So in years past, city councils rezoned mobile home parks to become single family subdivisions or office parks because I don't think they were really valued at the time in the way that now we recognize those are pockets of diversity. Those are affordable places for people to yeah, live. And we, should, definitely, definitely affordable. and we should plan them out of the city. And some of them actually are still nearby uh, major job centers, but they've been planned out. So we're actually going to rezone them back to mobile home to try to preserve those neighborhoods as an, as an asset. And that's, and I think we're gonna have a pretty strong vote. I think a lot of council members support that. And I think it goes to show how culture and attitudes and our values shift. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm proud of that. And we're also going to be working um, with the University of Texas to come up with a plan for the old Home Depot at St. John's and I-35 in the middle oh, of right. my district. 
that's been city owned it's for empty, a long time right and try to create services and recreation and affordable housing in a way that brings people back to a historically black neighborhood that's facing a lot of gentrification and so in lots of ways i think this council meeting where we're going to be trying to house homeless folks and stop putting them in jail so much and to bring tax fairness to the city and to preserve mobile homes and to try to bring people back that have been pushed out in lots of ways i think is sort of our direction of trying to figure out how we become the inclusive sort of place that we purport to be but so often in my time on council i found that we've got some places that we really need to make change if we actually want to live up to the hype and and we're trying to do that and it's hard and it's not gonna be perfect but we're yeah. but we're fighting and we're trying all right. Thank you so much, Greg. Because I have one final question yeah. for you. Uh -huh. Tomorrow morning at Leadership Austin, um, I'll be moderating a panel with the mayor and two regional mayors. Anything you want to ask them? You know, I think that uh, getting uh, real regional buy-in on this mass transit system mm -hmm. will be really important because federal dollars and state dollars, oftentimes they ask a region what they yeah, think. They depend on them. Yeah. and. And I think folks need to understand and recognize that if this is where so many of the jobs are, that moving people around inside of Austin is good for the region too. And so asking for their support in that way, I think will be really important. And I hope, and I think that they understand that, but that I think talking about how Austin needs mass transit will need some level of regional buy-in. All right, Greg Kassar, cool. thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. Yeah. Big. Big week next week for the Austin City Council. Two days of meetings, yeah. almost 200 items on the agenda. If you are a City Hall follower and like to have your voice heard, come on down and, and uh, make your voice heard and, and listen to what's going on in your community. Thanks so much for sharing your time with us this afternoon here on Decibel Dialogue. I'm Judy Maggio. We'll Thanks, see you next time.